Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming out to the Node.js meetup. I'm Ethan. I'm one of the co-organizers of this meetup. Aaron Madsen, who is the main organizer, unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, we have a couple of great talks scheduled. One's from Bill Rowan, software developer at Plaid. The other is from Andrew Powers, who I keep asking if he's here. He's not yet, so either he'll show up during Bill's presentation or he won't. We'll see. But before we get started, huge thanks to Arun for being here and OC Tanner for letting us have the facility and providing the food. Arun, are there any OC Tanner announcements you'd like to share here at the meetup? Um, uh, we are just a B2B company, uh, in the uh, recognition space, uh, and we are in Japan. So we are mainly known for uh, uh, I work as a software senior software engineer. Uh, if you have any questions, come talk to me. I can tell you anything more that you want to know about OC Tanner. Awesome. Thanks, Arun. With that, then, let's turn the time over to Bill. That's for syncing audio and video. Um, OK, hello, everyone. Thank you for having uh, me. And, and a few other members of my team are here as well today. Uh, this is our first time at the Utah Node.js meetup. So thank you for, for having us here. We're looking forward to coming back again. Um, so the topic of today's presentation is scaling Node at Plaid. Uh, I will say a few words about who Plaid is for some context, and then we'll dive right into what the project was. So uh, the, the goal here basically was to scale up. We have a, a bank integration service that runs on Node, and uh, we had hit the limits of uh, scaling of our existing scaling strategy, and we had to devise a new scaling strategy. So this. Uh, Talk tells the story of uh, how we uh, switch from one scaling strategy to the other, what the obstacles we encountered along the way, how we optimized the performance of our new uh, Node.js cluster setup, and et cetera. Um, so I hope you all enjoy it. Uh, it was a pretty interesting project to work on, and I think we learned a lot about Node.js performance limitations along the way that I think are probably relevant to a lot of people here. Uh, so first, greetings from Plaid Salt Lake City. Um, so we are Plaid Salt Lake City. I have a few of my colleagues here today. Um, we were founded in 2018. Uh, we have 30 engineers and growing in Salt Lake City. Uh, we just moved into a new building downtown on Main Street. Um, and uh, Plaid Salt, Salt Lake City office is responsible for the core bank integration stack that powers all 10,000 uh, of our bank uh, connections uh, across all geographies. So uh, the core, the, the point is that the Plaid Salt Lake City office is, is very core to our global operations uh, and uh, is only going to become more so. Um, so we're really excited about the work that we're able to do here. Um, Plaid, uh, the larger company, Plaid, uh, has 450 employees, most in San Francisco and New York. Uh, and a few weeks ago, it was announced that we were being acquired by Visa, pending regulatory approval. So. Um, Someday soon, I'll be able to say that we are an independent business unit of Visa, but for now, we're still uh, Plaid. <laughs> um, so a little bit of background on Node.js at Plaid. Uh, originally, our entire stack was built in Node.js, uh, starting from around 2012. Uh, our API server, as well as our bank integration service, and, and a lot of ancillary services. In 2016, we made a few big changes to our stack. Uh, the first was we replaced the API server with Golang. Uh, frankly, that was a bad idea. Um, but at the same time, we also did uh, something that was really great, which was we introduced TypeScript for our bank integrations. Uh, so we, uh, everything was still on Node. We rewrote, rewrote a lot of the framework code and the bank integration code in TypeScript. And that has allowed us to scale uh, from, at the time, we only had like 13 banks that we integrated with. And so that's what allowed us to scale safely from 13 to 10,000 bank integrations. Uh, so today, uh, we have over 720,000 lines of TypeScript. I, I almost didn't believe that when I ran WC to preparing the slide, but uh, 720,000 lines of TypeScript uh, in our bank integrations repository, and 100% of that is maintained by Plaid Salt Lake City. Uh, so um, some background on the project, why we decided to invest in concurrency. So the uh, goal of the project was to transition from the existing architecture where we ran a single task per node process uh, 
Uh, and we scaled that strategy all the way up to 4,000 Amazon ECS containers. Um, and it was, it, that worked remarkably well, frankly, uh, until we, you, know, you get to the 4,000 mark and the ECS infrastructure started to break down. Honestly, the biggest issue for us was the uh, deployment speed. We, uh, uh, there's a uh, fixed constant in ECS about how many containers it will take down and redeploy at a time. And that honestly was the main bottleneck that we hit that uh, forced us to rethink our strategy. Uh, so uh, in another interesting consequence of this approach, having a fixed number of containers running a single task at a time, is that when we had a fixed capacity, we can only do 4,000 tasks at a time. Uh, and so. Uh, how do we handle API spikes, et cetera? Uh, well, fortunately, API traffic, uh, that is traffic being generated directly by our clients, uh, making on-demand extra data extraction requests to our system, that only accounts for a tenth of our total traffic. So we used a strategy of prioritizing API traffic over the batch traffic. So we could safely accommodate 10x spikes in API traffic before we'd actually have to start uh, rate limiting those API uh, requests. Uh, so what was the problem with this? Deploy speed, I already mentioned. Um, we were, as we continued to scale up, we were seeing bigger and bigger API spikes, and we'd already hit this limit on 4,000 containers. Um, furthermore, this load shedding behavior, sh shedding the batch extractions, this is not ideal, it worked, but it did mean that our batch behavior was very difficult to predict and uh, limited the guarantees we could make uh, on our product to our customers. Uh, additionally, the model was complicated. We had to do a lot of bookkeeping to maintain the set of free workers and the set of available workers. Uh, and furthermore, uh, there was a high base memory utilization uh, and not running multiple tasks at a time didn't allow us to amortize that high base memory cost. So um, the, uh, I'm not lying about the 800 megabytes. We, you get more than a handful of node modules that you're importing, and uh, all of that, all of those node modules take up memory as well as space on disk when you when you load them into your process. So, we um, we were missing a significant optimization opportunity there. Uh, so, again, the new architecture here was well, we'll just run more than one task at a time. The change itself was very simple. Uh, we have a constant that said, don't accept more than one task at a time. We are switching to a model where it said, accept up to n tasks before you start rejecting requests. Uh, so that wasn't the problem. The question was, what are the, the unintended consequences of that change gonna be, and how do we safely roll this out and protect ourselves? Um, so there are a few strategies we employed in order to do this safely. Uh, the first is we uh, uh, maintain a second cluster. So the existing cluster, 4,000 containers that continue to run, uh, and then we, uh, we already had a dynamic load balancer that we were using to uh, manage that, those free worker pools. So we just built logic into that that um, would direct traffic between the single worker cluster and the uh, concurrent worker cluster. Uh, and we could control that dynamically. We didn't need to redeploy any code or anything. So if things started to spiral out of control or, or we were seeing weird task failures, we could always shunt traffic back over. Um, the, uh, uh, another important thing about that strategy is we only ran the batch traffic on the experimental cluster. So we were, we were experimenting on our production traffic, but only on the non-essential batch traffic that we were already load shedding anyway. So we were never gonna experiment on our API traffic. The API traffic has, is very sensitive to latency uh, and, uh, uh, is very sensitive to latency, so we, we want to minimize the amount of time our, our customers are spending uh, waiting on API requests, uh, and also very sensitive to failures. The batch traffic, not so much. So we're happy to experiment on that and run that on the uh, separate cluster. Um, we also were able to dynamically adjust the level of concurrency in that second cluster, so we could um, you know, very quickly iterate on different levels of concurrency and see how the system behaved. Uh, and then we also had lots of logging in place to observe low level metrics for our, our node processes, GC stats, uh, heap usage, uh, CPU usage, et cetera, et cetera uh, as well as uh, application level performance indicators, the most critical of which was uh, the task latency. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we measured uh, and optimized for task latency uh, later on. All right, so um, 
with all of that as background, um, we turned the system on and we saw how it behaved. And uh, the rest of the slides are the story of the different issues that we ran across, the different bottlenecks, and um, how we investigated them and how we f uh, fixed those. So hopefully this is the interesting part of the presentation. All right, so the first issue that we saw uh, when we turned on concurrency is we started seeing uh, our node processes crashing uh, from uh, heap out of memory errors. Uh, and so we've probably all seen this before. Um, V8 will just crash if, uh, if you get a failed memory allocation. So uh, we, uh, it wasn't too much to investigate here. The, the obvious thing to do was to increase the amount of heap space allocated to our node processes. We already had plenty of memory available on the uh, machines that we're running on. So we didn't need to allocate any extra RAM to the actual instance or the container. We just needed to increase the amount of uh, memory that node was allowed to use. So we, uh, the default is 1.7 gigabytes. We've bumped that up to six gigabytes and that totally resolved all these errors. Uh, and and we're, or and put another way, I'm sure there is a level of concurrency at which we would have started hitting these errors again, but by, um, by bumping it up to six gigabytes, we ran into a different bottleneck before we ever saw this problem again. Uh, so that one was pretty easy to fix. Uh, the biggest issue that we had to deal with was what I'm calling the big memory leak, uh, because we started seeing graphs that look like this. So this is uh, from our Grafana dashboard, tracking the heap usage uh, across all of our different containers that are running uh, parallel extractions. Um, so this is, again, one of these key uh, indicators that we are tracking to observe what increasing the uh, concurrency on our system, uh, how, how that affected the performance. So uh, sort of what you can see from this graph is most containers are sort of in steady state using about a gigabyte of memory, but a handful of them, in fact, quite a lot of them, uh, would eventually hit a point where they they started leaking memory and would l almost linearly increase their memory uses until they started to plateau at that six gigabyte heap limit. Uh, and uh, when we hit that six gigabyte heat limit, the, the, we wouldn't get out of memory errors, the process wouldn't crash, but throughput would crash down to zero, basically. Uh, and I, you know, in, on further investigation, we're discovering these containers are basically spending all of their time uh, doing GC, which makes sense. So, uh, what was going on? This one took the most investigation and, and there were actually a few um, optimizations that we had to employ to fix it. Um, so the underlying cause uh, was, and this, we were able to sort of reason our way towards this. So if you look at this behavior with this steadily increasing memory usage, it was clear that if some per task thing was getting started and then accumulating, like, we weren't blocking on the, com the completion of that task before returning from the main task. So we were basically starting off some fire and forget operation that uh, was taking long enough to complete that it was accumulating faster than it was clearing. So we had this implicit queue basically going on inside of our process. Uh, and we didn't see this when we were doing the one task at a time model because our overall throughput was so low uh, there, we didn't accumulate, um, I, these fire and figure operations never had a chance to accumulate rapidly enough uh, that, they, that they would cause this memory issue. So uh, this was pretty easy to find once we had the idea, well, it must be this fire and forget thing because we already had a linter rule saying no floating promises. Uh, and so we just had to go look at the handful of places where we'd intentionally disabled that to enable ourselves to do some kind of fire and forget operation. Uh, and so we quickly honed in on this one, this uh, compress and upload debugging payload operation. Um, so what this is intended to do is uh, take a bunch of the data generated over the course of that bank extraction and uh, package that up into a payload and then upload that to S3 so that we could then retrieve it later as part of our debugging workflow. And this is a pretty essential part of our debugging process. Yes? What, is, what do you mean by floating promises? I've never heard that term before. Oh, sure, uh, great question. So, um, so this line, uh, compress and upload debugging payload that you can see in this code, that returns a promise. Uh, so a representation of this asynchronous operation that we've kicked off, but we are not awaiting it. Unlike the line above it, you can see await generate debugging pay payload. So uh, the analogy, this isn't actually the right way to think about it, but the analogy is uh, 
there's sort of a main thread uh, and await says, okay, block on the operation of this other thread before you continue. Uh, and in this, in this other case where we don't await the result, uh, we're basically kicking off another thread to go uh, execute uh, while continuing to, to go ourselves. So it's not actual threads, of course, because it's node, but, um, uh, but that's, I think, the easiest way to understand it. So a floating promise is just a promise that's never uh, awaited on, never blocked on. The results are never uh, asked for. So there's, uh, the other thing we could have done here is, is called the dot then method on the return promise to attach some follow on work. Uh, but in this case, uh, we expect this asynchronous operation to go complete by itself. Uh, and we don't care about the results. The results are it uploads to S3. Uh, but great question. Um, so what we figured out was going on here is this compress and upload debugging payload was one, taking up a lot of memory. So that, that debugging payload itself is very large because it contains a lot of network request data. Uh, and uh, secondly, it was taking a really long time for it to complete and eating up a lot of CPU as it did so. so we get this uh, implicit queue stacked up on the event loop of these compress and uploading debugging, <laughs> compress and upload debugging payload operations uh, that would then themselves take up a lot of resources, slowing the whole machine down uh, and causing that big spike in memory usage. So uh, how do we confirm that this was the case? Uh, well, we just temporarily disabled it, say, okay, well, if this is what's causing the problem, let's try turning it off and see how the system behaves without it. Uh, and as this image is supposed to show, that we did not, no, no longer saw the issue we were showing before. Uh, we only saw that steady state one gigabyte heat memory usage. Um, so we knew for sure this was the culprit. Uh, but this was no solution because we needed that debugging payload. It wasn't an option to just turn it off. And did you intuit that or did you use a tool to tell you there's a bunch of memory that's coming at this bump? Um, we intuited that. Okay. So there, we knew there were only a handful of places where we were doing this floating promise thing. And this, was, this one was pretty obvious because we know that the debugging payload is huge. Uh, it's basically all of the network traffic that's generated over the course of the interaction with the bank. Uh, and then the process itself, also a good culprit for using a lot of CPU because what does it do? It's, it serializes that data, uh, it then compresses it, uh, and then it base64 encodes it, and then it uploads it to S3. So it's using a lot of resources, using a lot of memories, using a lot of CPU, it's using a lot of network. Uh, so, that was the first thing we, we uh, looked at, and then once we disabled it, it was pretty clear. The uh, performance characteristics of the application totally changed. Um, so one option to fixing this would be to block on that promise, to call a wait. So we don't let them accumulate. Uh, the process won't finish and accept a new task until it's completed this part of the task. So that was, that would have worked, but we were unwilling to pursue that solution because it would add significant amount of latency to the overall task completion time. The reason why we're doing a floating promise in the first place, doing a fire and forget operation, is because we didn't want to block on it because it was not essential and was irrelevant to the successful completion of the task. Uh, so we said, well, let's look into what it's actually doing and, and maybe we can optimize this so that we can, we can uh, tackle the underlying performance issue that's causing these things to build up in this queue. Uh, so the first thing that we discovered uh, when uh, trying to optimize this uh, was that we had a bottleneck in the S3 upload step, which was kind of surprising. Uh, I'd expect that to be relatively quick. Uh, Amazon presumably has a good network uh, connection uh, to itself. Um, but uh, the data was unmistakable. We, we instrumented each step of this process uh, to time how long it took, it took each step to complete. Uh, and we were seeing this, uh, this finished uploading data log reporting upwards of four minutes of time just to upload a few megabytes to S3, uh, which is pretty ludicrous. So uh, what was going on here? Uh, well, this is one of my favorite lessons of this whole project uh, because uh, what it came down to was a different default setting within the Amazon S3 uh, JavaScript client uh, than what the node default behavior is. So uh, the default node HTTP agent uses a default max sockets value of infinity. So if you don't set the max sockets parameter when constructing an HTTP agent, uh, 
uh, it defaults to infinity, and Node will happily open as many sockets to the host as you, as, uh, you can generate. Uh, but somebody at Amazon had decided uh, when they were building the S3 client library that they didn't like this behavior, maybe because they knew that they were accepting those sockets on the other, hand, other side. Uh, and so they just changed the default behavior to 50. So if you didn't set this parameter, you'd inherit a value of 50. Uh, and we had not read the docs deeply enough to understand that when we used the Amazon S3 client library. Uh, so the solution here was, uh, well, we will set our own max sockets property. We set it to uh, 20,000, um, just an arbitrarily large number. Uh, and uh, this totally eliminated this problem. So the, after employing this change, the latency reported by that finished uploading data log dropped to basically zero, as it should have been. Uh, so that was the first big bottleneck. Uh, the second big bottleneck was in the JSON serialization step. If I go back to the original code, so you can see we, we do the compression, um, and then uh, we do this the streamify step, uh, and then we do the uh, the Zlib uh, compression step, then we do the base64 encoder step. So there, there are four steps, um, or I guess three steps actually. Uh, and it was actually a, a big surprise to us that the, uh, the serialization was the bottleneck. I, 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 you know, I feel like compression is a much more CPU intensive process. Uh, so we looked into the, uh, stream of, or the stringification library that we're using. Uh, also, we we weren't using the, the built-in JSON that stringify here because we didn't want to block the event loop. We knew that these were big payloads, so we were intentionally using a library that operated on streams uh, and did uh, process the payload a chunk at a time uh, and yielding the event loop in between, uh, specifically so that we would avoid blocking the event loop. Uh, and to do that, we'd found this NPM library, uh, BFJ, which stands for Big Friendly JSON. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> It was one of it, I mean, we've all been here before, right? We like have a problem, we go to uh, NPM, we search for the top result and we just use that. Uh, but we hadn't bothered to compare it to the, any other JSON streaming library. Uh, and so we decided to do that in this case. And what we found when we benchmarked it against this other one, JSON stream, uh, so we benchmarked it against JSON stream as, as well as benchmarking against uh, JSON at stringify. And we found a, a 5x performance penalty of using BFJ over this other JSON streaming library, JSON stream. Uh, and you know, I, I later looked at the BFJ documentation uh, and it says really explicitly, don't use this if you have any performance needs at all. Like this is not designed to be highly performant. So I, that, we should have read that and uh, understood at the time, I guess. Um, but I guess this illustrates another important point uh, about engineering, which is, you know, if it ain't broke, uh, it wasn't broke up until this point. It wasn't broken until we decided to start uh, uh, pushing the limits of scaling our service. Um, and so we had no need to optimize it until now. Uh, so we replaced BFJ with J uh, JSON stream and uh, the memory leak behavior that we were observing basically went away. Uh, so uh, those two optimizations together were enough to fix this performance bottleneck and we're able to move on to the next thing. All right, so um, before I get into this sort of the next bottleneck, I wanted to talk about one of the tools that we use, uh, which is the task latency ratio. So uh, this was how we were measuring, uh, this is sort of our, our main KPI for measuring the performance of our system. Uh, and the idea here uh, is that we are graphing the average task latency on the concurrent cluster over the average task latency in the single worker cluster. Because remember, we're still running the single worker cluster and still directing a portion of traffic to that. So the goal here uh, was to establish what is the penalty of concurrency? How much additional latency are we incurring by um, uh, trying to be more efficient about using all the resources on this machine? Uh, and the goal uh, ultimately was to uh, optimize our application to bring that ratio down to one. We, we wanted there to be no penalty to running concurrency. Uh, another way of viewing that goal, a corollary of that goal is uh, that our goal was to maximize the level of concurrency that we could achieve while holding the task uh, latency ratio to one. Uh, and so find, the goal is sort of find that optimal point where we're using as much of the resources of the machine as we can without incurring any penalty uh, to the uh, performance of our system. Uh, in this case, the, uh, 
the application performance metric that we care about is the latency. We didn't really care about anything else. Um, so as you can see, sort of to start with, at this point, uh, this phase of the cycle, uh, we're seeing pretty high lat latency ratios. Um, this, the different lines represent different bank integrations. Uh, they all have their own performance characteristics, so we generally looked at these things uh, on a per bank basis. Uh, and so, yeah, there are some of these that were close to one, but a lot of them were hovering around the two area and some as high as, as eight times. What does the scale represent? What is a one? Is that a unit of seconds, milliseconds? Uh, yeah, so um, the ratio here is unitless, but it's, it's seconds over seconds. So uh, basically, if I ran a single task, it's a, a task here is go extract the two most recent weeks worth of transactions data from Wells Fargo, for example. So we would run that same task on the single worker cluster, and then we'd run that task on the uh, concurrent worker cluster, uh, and we'd measure the total task latency, and we'd uh, calculate the ratio of the total latency between those two. So in this case, um, I forget which institutions these represents, but like the yellow line here is showing, let's say it's Wells Fargo, that running at a given concurrency um, level of say 30 concurrent tasks per worker uh, was causing each one of those tasks to run six times as slowly as it would if it had the node all to itself. So these, which of these represent parallel and which of them represent single? Um, so each one of these lines represents the ratio of parallel over single for a given institution. So yellow might be Wells Fargo, and then one of these lines down near the bottom, um, a green line might be Chase, um, one could be US Bank. Uh, so we could isolate it to just look at a single um, line, uh, and that would tell us, okay, over the, la you know, over the last period of time, uh, what was the average uh, r latency for all tasks running on the parallel cluster for that institution over the average latency for all tasks running on the single worker cluster so for that if institution. So worked, the top would be one and the bottom would be zero, we'd be seeing something like 0 0.25 as the average. If um, it worked correctly or as expected. If it, worked as, uh, if it worked as expected with no performance penalty, then I expected to see all lines on one. Uh, basically, there is... It takes exactly as much time to run a task on the concurrent worker cluster as it does on the single worker cluster. Uh, so this was, this was helpful to have this, this dashboard because this was telling us if we make an intervention, uh, does that improve the ratio? Does it make it worse? Uh, does it allow us to boost the concurrency further before we start to see a spread in the, uh, in the ratio? Um, yeah? Did you have multiple CPUs as well? Um, no. So, uh, each container was, uh, so each container is running a single node process that's running concurrent tasks. Uh, and then the node process itself is, is single threaded. But the, there, was no, there was only one virtual CPU allocated to the container. Yes. Then, I, then that totally makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay, so the first bottleneck that we uh, investigated um, after we fixed the big memory leak uh, was we looked into garbage collection. Uh, so we'd already instrumented our process to collect and log garbage collection statistics. And uh, so this graph is showing, this is actually number of seconds per minute, uh, which is it's kind of a weird graph. But uh, basically what we're saying is, so if it's, tw if it's 20 seconds per minute, that means that this scavenge operation, this blue line, is taking up a third of all CPU time. Uh, so needless to say, that was pretty alarming. Uh, garbage collection, or at least one part of garbage collection, these other garbage collection steps weren't taking any time, but uh, just the scavenge part of the garbage collector was eating up a third of all of our CPU. So that was a pretty clear culprit for something we should try to optimize. Uh, so we investigated this uh, to figure out what was going on, what was even scavenged. None of us had that much experience optimizing the node garbage collector. Uh, and uh, what we discovered is uh, that reading the docs, you know, always read the docs, uh, was that the scavenge operation is all about reclaiming space from the new space region of the heap. So the new space region is for short-lived objects. So this is like the first um, generation in, in the generational garbage collector, generation zero. Uh, and uh, what we believe was happening uh, was that basically we were operating our sort of small object working set for our process at high concurrency levels was basically occupying fully 
that um, the, all the space that was allocated to this heap region. And so the garbage collector was having to run really frequently because we were constantly running out of memory in that region. Uh, and because the working set itself was so large, there wouldn't be that much space to, re to reclaim. Uh, and so the garbage collector would have to work really hard um, for very little benefit uh, every time it ran. So uh, how, 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 how can we reduce the frequency of garbage collection to get this, uh, this time spent way down? Um, well, uh, we, uh, we discovered this problem with the underlying working set demands for short-lived objects being too high. And that's when we discovered the max semi-space size uh, command line flag for Node. So the default value here is 16 megabytes. Uh, so by default, Node only allocates 16 megabytes to this, uh, this semi-space or, or new space part of the heap where it allocates uh, new objects. And so we bumped that up to a gigabyte and um, that as you can see from this graph, led to a precipitous decline in the amount of time we spent in the uh, scavenge operation. Uh, and so now, uh, I mean, we're still spending two or so seconds per minute, but uh, I think that's a lot more reasonable than 15 or 20 seconds. So um, that was the first big bottleneck that we discovered. Uh, so beyond that, we had to dig a little bit deeper into the performance of our application. There are no more obvious like system level performance issues that we saw to optimize. So uh, we decided to profile the CPU usage of our actual application to figure out is there anything that we're doing now that we can uh, optimize um, that will allow us to bump up that concurrency uh, even higher. Uh, so. We instrumented our production process uh, with a flame graph library called 0x. Uh, and this one, it was a bit of a hack, but basically we, we could start up a single process at a time in sort of uh, profiling mode and then uh, give it another signal to shut itself down, dump that profile, and then upload it to S3. So by doing this, we were able to collect these uh, like real uh, uh, production performance flame graphs uh, so we can begin investigating just where was our application spending all of that CPU time. Uh, and so the, um, the easiest uh, thing that jumped out to us here was all of those highlighted blue areas. That was time that we were spending in our logging library of all places. So. 15% of our total CPU time when we profiled it was spent logging, uh, which is, you know, again, puzzling. It's kind of like, why would it should it take four minutes to upload to S3? I mean, all we're doing is writing some JSON to disk, right? And then Logstash is handling actually sending that out to um, a different machine. So this was uh, a big surprise to us. So uh, we investigated that library a little bit more. And what did we find? Well, this logging library had been written four or five years prior. Uh, and no one had thought about it or touched it since then. And uh, what we discovered is it is, was doing, um, it was basically instantiating a lot of regex op objects uh, and scanning all of the keys and all of the values that were being logged with these regex objects uh, in an attempt to uh, discover if there's any PII basically included in any of these logs or any forbidden keys, et cetera. Uh, so this had long been part of our system. Again, nobody thought that it was a performance bottleneck or anything. Um, so uh, we found a few easy ways to optimize that, like don't re-instantiate the regex every time you want to test, the, uh, test a, a string, right? Instantiate it once and then test. So a, a few simple optimizations like that uh, reduced our overall CPU usage. So it reduced the time spent logging by over 75%, but this, this was an overall CPU reduction of over 10% just by changing the way that we were handling, uh, you know, looking for PII in our logs. Uh, so um, in conclusion, uh, you know, that was sort of the last big optimization that we employed. Uh, and uh, as a result of all these efforts, we were able to scale up our level of concurrency to about 30 without any latency penalty. So uh, going back to that task latency ratio, uh, the goal uh, was to, the sort of corollary of reducing that task latency ratio was being able to boost that concurrency. So we were able to get to 30 with no latency penalty, with a task latency ratio of one. Uh, that, in turn, allowed us to reduce the size of our cluster from 4,000 containers to about 150. Uh, this meant we were completely able to get rid of load shedding, 
Uh, so, and remove the hard cap on capacity. So if we did see an API traffic spike or, or any kind of traffic spike, um, we, that would simply uh, increase demands on our system, which would uh, take our throughput a little bit higher, which would incur a latency penalty, but that was sort of a graceful degradation rather than hitting a hard cap on, on overall throughput. Uh, and lastly, this allowed us to uh, use many fewer servers than we were before, because we're using the servers a lot more efficiently, using our CPU a lot more efficiently, using our memory especially a lot more efficiently. I called that out at the beginning. We had this big uh, per process overhead that now we're amortizing over 30 different tasks. Uh, so that uh, in total was about 300K of estimated savings per year um, as a result of, of doing this. Um, some, some learnings that we got from this project. Um, uh, the things we found particularly valuable, importance of low-level metrics. Uh, we only discovered things like the GC scavenge operation because we thought to instrument that. Um, looking at the, the heap usage was another big one for us. Um, flame graphs are great. Um, we would never have figured out the thing about the logging library if we didn't have that flame graph showing us the way. Um, having a keen understanding of the node runtime is really important. Uh, I, this is, it's, it's very easy, I think, to write JavaScript code and, and not even understand how the async model works um, for simple code. Uh, but when, especially when you need to, when you're investigating some of these unusual performance bottlenecks, you really need to understand how Node works. Uh, and uh, being able to tweak some of those levers, I, it can, I, a lot of the problems that we encounter, we were able to completely eliminate just by changing some of the VM settings. Uh, that. I, you know, I, I've worked with Node for a decade, and I've never seen most of these options before. Um, and then lastly, my favorite lesson of all, read the docs. Um, we had no idea that this Amazon library had different default behavior than Node did by default. So um, if we just paid a little bit more attention, we would have discovered that much more quickly. Uh, and then I have a short epilogue. So that's the conclusion of this story. We, we finished the project. We declared victory, moved on, shipped that. Uh, the epilogue here is a few months after the conclusion of the concurrency project, we upgraded from node 8 to node 12. Uh, so those of you who, I, I don't, if any of uh, the rest of you were unfortunate enough to still be on node 8, you'd know that uh, the end of life is happening right about now. So we, we desperately needed to get off of node 8. Uh, and we were quite tardy in doing that. There were, there were several LTS releases that we skipped in between. Um, but uh, one of the unexpected benefits, we thought we were doing this just because we had to, because node 8 was on end of life, but one of the unexpected benefits uh, was that it greatly increased our performance. So a lot of those uh, performance indicators that we were tracking for the concurrency project, we saw a big and, uh, and a significant increase just by upgrading to node 12. Uh, so this is the heap usage graph. Um, you can see a step change in the CPU utilization, uh, and then that uh, extraction latency also um, decreased significantly. Uh, so th what's the takeaway? Uh, stay up to date in your node. Uh, uh, Google's doing a lot of great work further optimizing the V8 engine, so uh, take advantage of that uh, if you have a performance issue. Uh, and with that, I'm done, so thank you for listening through all of that. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Good call out. So what's next? You guys go to 60 or 30 for <laughs> process? And uh, so what does that look like? Uh, great question. So um, we actually, uh, one thing that I was, uh, you know, if I would go back and do this project again, I would have started with an explicit concurrency goal. Um, we sort of went through this whole thing with, a, well, let's just see how high we can get it. And I was really excited. I really wanted to go, to, like, let's get to 1,000. Um, so uh, what, what, what are these tasks doing? They're largely making a request to a bank, waiting, 
and then receiving that request eventually. The bank servers, are, turns out, are really slow, and it probably doesn't surprise anyone. Um, so we wait many seconds for these requests, and then uh, the process itself consisted largely of you know, pulling fields out of the bank response and building new JSON objects. So this, is, this kind of workload should be ideal for Node, right? It's uh, like the async uh, model should, should be perfect for this sort of thing. Um, so I was really excited, let's get to 1,000. But that, that wasn't, I mean, that was just a round number. So I wish we'd started with an explicit goal. Like, we didn't start with a goal of 30. Uh, it turns out 30 allowed us to achieve all of our objectives. 15 might have allowed us to achieve all of our objectives. 10 probably would have allowed us to achieve all of our objectives. So we, honestly, I think we probably should have stopped. Like, we didn't need to do the flame graph and further optimize our process, and that was fun. Uh, but. Uh, we probably didn't need to do that to hit our actual business goal, which was to resolve this deployment bottleneck. That was the primary issue. So uh, in terms of, uh, of like what's next for this, uh, 30, we're seeing great performance, more than adequate performance for our, our needs with, with 30. Um, if uh, any of my colleagues, we have a, a hackathon that's coming up soon. If you want to hack on this, you want to push it to 60 or 1,000, um, I guess that's what, that's what Hack Week is for. But uh, in terms of business needs, um, the system is performing great. Uh, so I imagine that this system will probably continue to exist largely as it is for at least a few years until uh, we hit some other scaling bottleneck of this system that we, we can't anticipate today. I mean, it's, it's similar to how we ended up with the 4,000 containers in the first place. Uh, I mean, n no one ever w planned, oh, we're going to deploy 4,000 node containers on ECS. I mean, that's, that's just crazy. And we ended up there because we started with 100, and, well, we could just keep boosting the number in EC2 uh, and whenever we hit a, a bottleneck, uh, and that kept working until we got to about 4,000. So I, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but... Uh, it sounds like you said it's just diminishing returns to do anything further, so there's no point. Yeah. Other than maybe your interest yeah, I, I, I would love to hit 1,000. Uh, we did, uh, so we're, we're currently operating at 30. We did test it up to about 150. Uh, so we were able to push that concurrent. So the way we would test this is uh, we'd start with a fixed capacity in the parallel cluster, and then we'd use that dynamic load balancer to shift more and more traffic onto it until the system started to break. Uh, and so, and then we'd measure, okay, what was our average uh, task concurrency? Where, where does it break? Uh, yeah, the um, uh, I don't know exactly. I wish I, I could remember better, uh, but I think we were able to push it up beyond 120. And basically, what we saw was that the uh, the latency got so high that our throughput started to go down rather than up as we added more tasks. And you haven't done analysis on that to know what's causing the latency. No. Yeah, we, so our primary uh, iteration loop here was run one of these tests at a very high concurrency level uh, and then uh, see what breaks or what the bottleneck is. So that's how we discovered a lot of these problems. Uh, right? we, we cranked the concurrency up and then we saw that big spike in memory usage. Uh, we cranked the concurrency up and then we saw the, um, uh, you know, the, the GC uh, just totally blow up on us. Um, and so that, that was, a lot, made it very obvious where we needed to go and optimize. So if we want to keep doing this project, we do the same thing. We push it up, go to 150, um, see if anything breaks or blows up, or um, see what, how that, what that does to the task latency ratio, and then maybe go look at the flame graph or, um, or wherever, you know, collect other data on where the bottleneck is showing up. So your coworker mentioned that you deploy 50 packs or so a day. Yeah. Do you have a performance litmus test in your CI CD pipeline to uh, safeguard against regressions, or is it more like you reactive? Like, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, although, I mean, Austin might be able to speak a little bit more to this. Uh, you worked on a project recently around the um, sort of automatic rollbacks, like detecting uh, issues with deploys and automatically rolling back. I don't think we have any performance. I don't think we're tracking. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah actually. <laughs> Yeah, your, your question of what's next, uh, I think fixing Jenkins is what's next, or moving off of Jenkins to something else is what's next. Um, we, we, have a, we do something Deep Work Wednesday, where we basically don't have meetings on Wednesday. Uh, and it's like reliable every Wednesday uh, CI time spike, because we saturate the available workers on our Jenkins cluster, because everyone's actually getting work done. Uh, and, uh, and I remember like, seeing this once and getting blocked on it, like I couldn't get my PR out, and I went to uh, have some words with the team responsible for maintaining our Jenkins cluster. And I was like, well, okay, why just add machines. Why can't you add machines? And I'm like, well, like, we are literally at the limit of the number of machines that Jenkins will allow us to add. So uh, Jenkins has a single master, uh, and there's a limit to the number of, like, we can't add any more slaves without overloading the master at this point. So, um, so that's, that's the next project, honestly. That's the primary bottleneck uh, in terms of like, what our like, uh, business goals are. Also, uh, of those 50 deploys a day, so this is our, our bank integration service. Uh, most of those changes are point changes to specific bank integrations. Uh, and the like, probability of a performance regression is very low. Uh, any given bank is a tiny percentage of overall traffic. So uh, we, we tend to be, the, the, the changes to the framework level that might actually impact you know, all of our traffic, um, those are much rarer. Uh, and so, uh, most of the monitoring for performance regressions we'll do manually for those kinds of changes. But you know, of that 50 changes, you know, maybe 45 are just small bug fixes to individual bank ex extractions, and so those are pretty low risk. Um, so, tell me, so, so this code runs on all your bank integrations? Yeah. One monolith that runs on each of these? Mm-hmm. Um, that's a good question. Uh, we have investigated that before. Uh, the main constraint, at least, it's been a long time since I looked at this. Uh, the, I remember when Lambda was first like, general availability, people got really excited about it. Uh, I, the main constraint that we discovered, honestly, was that uh, there is a hard cap to the latency of TAS in AWS Lambda. Uh, and you know, we talked a lot about task latency ratios. I didn't say much about actual task, task latency in absolute terms. Um, some of these bank data extraction processes, they can take 30 minutes or longer uh, because we're, I mean, we're, we're basically fundamentally blocked in how slow the institution is. So I think Amex is, has long been our highest latency institution because uh, we not only have to, like most institutions, you pull batches of transactions at a time. Uh, like there's, there's sort of paginate their transaction history. Amex, we have to fetch each individual transactions. Uh, and they're very sensitive to how many concurrent connections you have open to them. So uh, we, we have to throttle ourselves on, on how quickly we can pull um, those transactions. Also, this is compounded by the fact that with Amex, um, you can often have a single account that has many sub-accounts because it's like a business that has lots of authorized users that has like, tens of thousands of transactions on it. So, so Amex is like a good uh, benchmark for like absolute worst case performance issues. Uh, and like, our timeout on bank extractions is 30 minutes, mostly because of Amex. And so Lambda, it's, it's only like three or four minutes. I forget what it is. So that, that, unfortunately, that, that was sort of a hard no for us. Um, yeah, um, th moving off of AWS would be a big project at this point. Oh yeah. 
Uh, hopefully that answers your question. I, there's a lot of path dependency here as well, of course. Like we first started using ECS in 2017 because uh, we didn't have anybody at the company who knew anything about containers. We hired somebody who knew something about containers and he decided to use AWS. So we've been, er, e e ECS, so we, we've been using ECS now for the last three years. Uh, and we hired someone a year ago who's really into Kubernetes and he's been working on moving us over to Kubernetes for the last year and it's, it's just a big project. Um, but yeah, that was, I, that was a sort of, I guess, another sort of engineering parable here. Um, when we first started running into this deployment speed bottleneck, uh, it, this paralyzing our process was not, was not the first thing that we considered. Uh, so we, we eventually settled on this because we decided that was the best path forward. But the original uh, solution that was presented was like, oh, well, we won't have this deploy limitation if we were on Kubernetes. Like, this is a limitation of ECS, so let's move to Kubernetes. And I said, okay, great. Uh, how quickly can you get us onto Kubernetes? And it's like, oh, you know, eight months at the earliest. It's like, okay, well, then we need another solution, right? Because this is a, a serious problem we can't afford to wait eight months to fix. And we save money and stuff at the same time. It's a much better architecture. Um, but as a result, I don't care as much about ECS because it's not a problem. And time. Thank you all. Big thanks to Bill for the presentation. Andrew Powers, have you arrived yet?